professor John Davis tem um longo currículo eh, académico, profissional e eh, visitando a sua página é possível de facto eh, verificar eh, o, a quantidade de trabalhos que têm sido eh, e de lugares que têm sido eh, desempenhados pelo professor John Davis. Eh, foi eh, presidente ou chairman da History of Economic Society, da International Network for Economic Method, da Association for Social Economics, foi vice-presidente da European Society for the History of Economic Thought, tem vários livros publicados, numerosíssimos artigos, nós acompanhamos o seu trabalho há muitos anos, é sempre com grande prazer que eu leio os seus trabalhos. Portanto, Dear John, the floor is yours. I was telling the audience your long and relevant, highly relevant CV, and so the, the floor is yours now. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you for the kind invitation to speak again, and I suppose you said some nice things about me. And thank you for those remarks as well. This is a paper, as you can see, written with two people from Universita Torino, and uh, it continues research that we've begun, where we um, look at the relationship between different disciplines. And as you can see from the uh, first part of the title, particularly economics relationships with other disciplines. So the paper has a simple structure, but maybe some of the discussion is complicated. This is the foundation of the paper. As the title of the paper indicates, we are going to argue that economics imperialism, economics orientation to other disciplines, uh, essentially obeys the same logic as real capitalist economic imperialism. And to make that argument, we'll use the core periphery, or in the world economy, north-south distinction to say that you can see uh, that what the Chicago School does after Gary Becker uh, essentially models economic imperialism and reflects it. The second part goes to Danny Roderick and his well-known capitalism trilemma. And we take that trilemma and we apply it to relationships between disciplines. The third paper looks for a problem in this framework that Chicago and economics, economic imperialism uh, creates for itself. And we go back to Ricardo's famous theory and then we close the paper with remarks about long-term developments operating on the real economy and on social science that we argue points towards a more pluralistic world and more pluralistic economics. So the first part, same logic, same strategy, not commonly argued. The underlying premise that actually we build on to talk about Roderick is that nations and disciplines can be understood to be like one another. Maybe the same way is too strong, but like one another. So economic imperialism and economics imperialism will have the same ordering of north-south and core periphery. I think the economic imperialism about the real world of capitalism, that argument is clear to many people that there's a core periphery north-south organization. But the idea that economics imperialism in particular, the Chicago School uh, has that framework, that north-south core periphery organization, is one of the contributions I think the paper tries to make. And so it's been argued by, for example, Uskuli Mackey that when we talk about uh, economic imperialism and economics imperialism, they're two different things. But we say that, in fact, Economics imperialism, the orientation of especially Chicago School of Economics 
to other social sciences and to heterodox economics uh, is reflective of the same strategy of capitalism in the world economy. And here is, I think, uh, consonant with uh, research that's been done here at uh, Quindra, the key mechanism, the exporting of capital. So I think when we talk about financialization of the world economy, of capitalism, uh, export of capital is a familiar uh, foundation. But how can you talk about economics imperialism, economics, Chicago School in particular, orientation towards other social sciences using financialization? So that's the argument that we will attempt to make. So here, this is a summary remark, and really it's done very briefly and compactly. Uh, and people here have done a much better job on this topic than, than we have, so I'm making a very uh, concise uh, characterization of post-war imperialism, not earlier forms of imperialism. So for example, when the British occupied major parts of the world, it was an occupational type of imperialism. They implanted communities there. The post-war imperialism, after Richard Nixon leaves the gold dollar uh, standard and sets loose capital markets in the period of petrodollar recycling, inaugurates the beginning of capital mobility that defines the world that we currently live in. And so in the Latin America case where this was so fundamental to the first steps to exporting uh, capital from the north. Uh, new development policy, so I think many people have probably talked development economics, import substitution versus export promotion, those two regimes. And uh, the early export of capital from the north created significant indebtedness in Latin America and the crisis that is due to this is the recycling of petrodollars uh, through New York, especially, uh, led to this uh, strategy to open Latin America economies to end that long period up to the 1970s of strong economic growth. And so here I'm really not doing justice to the work that others have done, but uh, as I understand the financialization of the Portuguese economy, there is a before and after, so it's much like what happened in Latin America. The movement of capital into foreign capital, ex, uh, bank capital in particular, into Portugal, the, the, the role of the euro, uh, all basically worked to change the basis on which the uh, Portuguese economy worked, weakened domestic manufacturing, uh, a kind of uh, 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 development that was similar to, to what happened in uh, Latin America. And so you see the, the general argument. So I, I move on from here because I think other people can discuss this more adequately than I can. But the difficult argument to make is the financialization involved in Chicago School economics imperialism. So here's the framework again. Chicago School is the north within even mainstream economics or the core and certainly vis-a-vis -vis heterodox economics and relative to other social science disciplines and you see how the periphery is then conceived. To me this is the key figure. If you look at pre-war Chicago School economics it's about, uh, economics is about a subject a domain of life and activity, namely the markets, market process. And Becker says, no, that's not the correct definition, Lionel Robbins and others, of economics. Economics is defined by its method, its technique, its utility maximization foundation. And so it doesn't apply only to markets, it applies to everything. So. My, my wife wrote her PhD on the sexual division of labor, Marx versus Becker. And uh, 
How does a sexual division of labor in the household work? It's all by comparative advantage and utility maximization. So the method of utility maximization and then relationships between people understood in terms of comparative <coughs> advantage is sufficient to fully explain a non-market process where other types of social relationships were previously thought to explain uh, how people interacted and were the subject of other disciplines in economics. So Becker's really the foundation of the new Chicago, the post-war Chicago, and a theory that is imperialist, an economics imperialist approach by changing the definition of economics. These are the people who actually work out the theory of economics imperialism proudly. Not as a terrible thing to have done, but to justify the power of Chicago School of Economics and economics, mainstream economics. And so if they are going to explain relationships between disciplines as a trade relationship, the marketplace of ideas. If you talk about sociology and psychology and economics, how do they interact? Is it trade? Well, that was the argument, and this is the basis. But when you read these uh, three people, and this is the, the last and most important of the papers, they talk about uh, the analytic, hard, mathematical, comparative advantage of economics versus the soft, vague, comparative advantage of sociology, psychology, and other social sciences. And so they anticipate a one-way street. Comparative advantage, this is talking from two sides of the, the mouth, comparative advantage is a two-way street type analysis, but in the real world, it's a one-way street for Chicago. They anticipate trade surpluses. So here's the key step in the argument. As we know from trade theory, if you have a trade surplus, you're exporting capital. So what's the disciplinary capital that Chicago has to offer? It's the method, the analytic utility maximization. Everything, every human relationship can be explained on that basis. And so this we call capital because it's, a, it's an asset in effect, this particular conceptual apparatus. It's an asset that can be located as, a, as if like an enclave in other disciplines. So the, the idea of economics and imperialism is to enter into other disciplines, open up enclave space where this type of reasoning becomes important and uh, ultimately influence the development of those disciplines. Okay, Roderick. If disciplines are like nations, how do we explain the relationships between disciplines? So we go to the Stanford uh, Encyclopedia of Philosophy. This is a article that characterizes, there's much debate about how we talk about relationships between disciplines, but we have to accept the, or we have to start with some characterization, so we, we use one that this person has developed. Then we go to Roderick's Global Capitalism Trilemma and the three possible pathways it involves, and then we translate that into a disciplines trilemma to maintain the parallel between economic imperialism and economic imperialism. So really we're going to find the particular pathway for Roderick that implies economic imperialism. It's what he refers to as the golden straitjacket. And then we'll look at Chicago School's uh, orientation towards other disciplines and find the same golden straitjacket, their view, north-south view of, Ch of Chicago economics versus other social sciences uh, will have the Roderick characterization. So the, the advantage of using Roderick is he gives a, in the trilemma analysis, he gives a, a structure to interaction between nations, which is, well, paradoxical because it will see not only one pathway can work at any given time. And then it gives us a framework for talk, talking about interaction between disciplines, whereas in our view, the, the debate about 
interdisciplinarity, broadly speaking, or relationships between disciplines, is vague and too weak for defenders and proponents of pluralism. So that's the uh, destination. So I, I'm not sure. Maybe you keep tr uh, track of time because I'm uh, following the clock here. So let me just put these all up. Uh, I'm sure you can read faster than I can speak. This is the Chicago view. This is the word we use often in a friendly way. We think interdisciplinarity is a desirable understanding of how disciplines are connected. But it's a very, it's the most limited. If you go down to transdisciplinary, we have the most connected, the most synthetic role. And if you think about trade theory, uh, when you have trade, the nations are left largely intact because trade doesn't touch endowments. Maybe there's some migration, but basically capital and labor are immobile. And so you have only sort of an interfield exchange, like trade of goods and services. And the contributing disciplines are essentially unaffected. We say this is the purported position in Chicago because their idea that economics will run trade surpluses with other social sciences leads to capital exports. And so really, they're talking out of two sides of their mouth. What they claim, something wonderful about their view of economics relation to other disciplines, is a disguise, a mask, for how they really see the relationship of economics to other fields. So people on the left, they say, uh, Economics of pluralism is a bad thing, and Chicago says, no, it's a good thing. Actually, the people on the left are not, <coughs> because it's an attempt to manipulate. So here's my example. Cross-disciplinary. You borrow resources, uh, in fact, disciplinary capital, from another discipline, and you it may have transformative or may not have such effects on your own discipline. And so it, this, this story is still open with respect to behavioral economics. In my view, it is having transformative effects on economics. It's undermining rational choice theory. Slowly but surely, it's undermining the idea that people make rational choices. A question, a matter to be debated. This is uh, where people put, different disciplines put together different projects that they're engaged on. They find their similarities across disciplines. They have common problems. They're approaching them in different ways. It may or may not change those disciplines. So complexity theory is our example. And then transdisciplinarity, a new freestanding field, emerges different than disciplines. The disciplines may go on. They may be undermined. They may uh, be transformed. Uh, if you think of, in particular, cognitive science as a large new field that is really independent of its contributing disciplines, I think that's the example. So here's the standard trilemma. And I'll do the diagram in a second to make this simpler. From the old uh, debate over the autonomy of monetary theory, you can have two but not three. I'll do the diagram in just a moment. And the three possibilities are these, and you'll see that in the diagram in just a minute. Then Roger goes on. You can have two, but not three. And uh, these are the same names, uh, where do they go? Right here, that will apply uh, also to disciplines that Roderick uses for his capitalism trilemma. So the standard trilemma is on the top. And uh, if we go uh, before, uh, say, 1920, when the gold standard uh, crashes, uh, you have uh, fixed exchange rates. And uh, because you reconcile trade imbalances by movement of gold, uh, you lose monetary autonomy. So these two go together. This one goes out. Then this is the immediate post-war uh, solution. We have fixed exchange rates. Uh, capital is relatively immobile. 
prior to Nixon going off the gold dollar standard. And uh, so monetary autonomy is retained. And then the world we live in is the one up here. So this is what Roderick does. Uh, for his three nodes, this is light capital mobility. Uh, this is uh, whether or not you have democratic politics, whether or not internally or across the world. And then he's talking about nation states as his principal actors. And so the uh, immediate post-war story uh, was Bretton Woods. Nation states were preserved. Capital was relatively uh, immobile, so national economies were not highly integrated. And you had democratic politics within nations. But this is the world we live in. So uh, capital mobility, nation states, democratic politics within countries undermined because multinational capital and financial capital moves wherever it likes up here. Nations manage that capital mobility, but uh, people's well-being, social welfare goals are subservient now to the mobility of capital. And this is a world we are unlikely to move to, but maybe one that EU thought uh, it, it, it could still move to. Uh, economies uh, are integrated. Nation states are less important. This is the hard part, I think, to uh, fit with the story of the EU. Uh, and then mass politics works at the EU level in terms of the European Parliament. This would be what this is. Okay, so a lot to <coughs> very quickly. So now let's move to the discipline story. If the parallel is going to stay, I'm going to show you these replacements uh, in just a second, so I won't read them out. And then we're keeping the same names that he uses. And uh, they will uh, take two, each of these will take two and abandon the third. Okay. On the left is what I just showed you, and on the right is our new diagram. So I won't talk about quite yet these things here, but I will do the correspondence. So nation states are disciplines. Democratic politics, whether or not at the country level or across countries, uh, is now represented by scientists deciding what they want to do. If you're a heterodox economist and you want to do something the mainstream doesn't like, what self-determination do you have? So that's the issue here is how much autonomy researchers and scientists have. And up here, economic integration. This is this idea, this ideal, that all science must subscribe to a single vision of what science is. The unity of science, and as you can imagine with natural science, physical science, and a very clear view of what science is, or at least compared to social science, it's social science that has to adjust to uh, that ideal. So our three pathways are, uh, if we, under Chicago's influence, say Chicago has, with its analytic technique and mathematization, the correct ideal. It operates by the, the, the best vision of what science is, the ideal vision of science, then what we're doing here is we're giving up non-standard, non-mainstream, and social science that doesn't abide by economics vision of what social science is. All self-determination science goes out, and so the open straight jacket appears. And I'll talk about reductionism in a moment. Alternatively, there are some people, we argue David Collier is an example, who still hold that there is one, should be one vision. He has a different vision of what ideally science should be than uh, a very uh, uh, natural science type uh, vision. And he thinks that we will not have disciplines. Disciplines could go away altogether. And scientists work across a disciplinary space without clear uh, boundaries if they subscribe to this alternative vision. So I can't really talk about David's work very carefully here. And then a third view is we toss this right here. This top-down 
uh, view of what science must be. We accept a more pluralistic <coughs> idea that there's many strategies in science. It's not all math. It could be, well, you could have a verbal narrative. You could, you could use uh, interviews. You could have all sorts of ways of talking about what science can do. There's no single ideal. And so scientists then can do as they choose, as they uh, are inspired to do, and, but we retain disciplinary boundaries. We call this Bretton Woods. So that's the heavy lifting in the paper, trying to trans translate this. Now I'll talk about how we methodologically characterize these approaches. So Chicago, it's reductionist because it takes its conception of the unity of science ideal. Hard science, uh, mathematization, analytic uh, approach, uh, sharply defined concepts, uh, the utility maximization idea. And uh, in a top-down way, it uh, claims that this is the correct understanding of how sciences interact. So self-determination, the scientist's independence is what's given up. The global integration view, we call this integrationist, because while disciplines go away, the independence of disciplines goes away, still there is this top-down view that all science must ideally be done in some fashion. And so we call this, and I have to go back to definitions to, to remind you of the way we look at these two terms, but this is a uh, between science shared uh, sort of a project, perhaps it only goes to just one synthetic view of uh, science under this uh, unity of science ideal. And then lastly, we would like to move back in time. We talk about a complexity view. So the Bretton Woods view, uh, unity of science top down is given up. And we talk about unity of science as a bottom up outcome. What is the, what explains our scientific world across the different types of researchers, researchers and investigations? It comes up in a complex way that is not simple to explain. So we retain self-determination of science, and we retain the independence of disciplines. And so we look at this as the sort of general transition. Okay. So, reductionism, Chicago says disciplines must follow their idea of what ideally science is. Uh, I'll skip this for now because we think this is not the likely future. Uh, but on a pluralistic view of the world, we, we see disciplines still having a relative integrity because they have different subject domains, so they investigate different uh, types of concepts and issues. And uh, we try to maintain autonomy and self-determination in science. So we think how this, these are combined is a, is a complexity sort of matter. So this is a summary slide for this uh, part here. Uh, we think with Roderick, we have made a strong case that economic, economics imperialism and economic imperialism are essentially the same structures. The north-south corporate framework is Chicago dictating its unity of science <coughs> idea towards other sciences. So it claims to respect disciplines differences, Chicago School, that is, it, it promotes to the trade idea of how disciplines interact what we define as interdisciplinarity. But really, this is the story here, the classic economics and imperialism story. And when we talk about post-war capitalism, it's the golden straitjacket again. Supposedly free trade, but free trade, as Prebish Singer have shown to be the consequence of new development policy and the continued financialization of the South. <coughs> okay, so I'm moving towards uh, the, the end. There's not quite as much here. I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. Uh, 
we go back to Ricardo, we talk about his rising rents theory. And we are going to argue that the gold and straight jacket in both respects is a self-undermining process. So you know this story of Ricardo. And I've modernized it a bit here. The extension of cultivation. Remember the story that Ricardo has? That's really the perfect of capitalism because those new lands were either not under capitalist production or they were small uh, subsistence type uh, uh, farmers. And when those new lands are taken under cultivation, the rents show up inframarginally on the better lands. This is an important uh, point. And so the argument that he makes is that uh, trying to defend capitalism, Ricardo, is that this is putting the profit share at risk because previously, before you got to any uh, marginal lands, there are no rents. If you just say all the land is of, of a single quality, there are no rents. But as soon as you differentiate the marginal and inframarginal lands, rents emerge. So all, so all the earnings no longer just go to profits. They're rents, emergent. And this is a contradiction for Ricardo in capitalism of his time because the engine of growth for him is profits. Well, they had a solution in 1842. They passed the Corn Laws and said, we'll just take the uh, cheaper agricultural produce, the corn, from other countries. But that's not the avenue that current capitalism has available to it. It has the South as its domain of cultivation. So we argue the expansion of the North into the South, the periphery, by the export of financial capital, creates the financial sector in the North, inframarginally within capitalism. At the heart of capitalism, the financial sector, as we now understand it, has emerged there. And so the consequences we say are essentially the same, and the argument is done very quickly. The emergence of this <coughs> financial sector at the heart of capitalism acts as a cost and effectively is a rent. So to get that capital is exported uh, to uh, uh, the South. Uh, it costs the productive capital that locates in the South uh, this uh, rent that they uh, need to pay, the cost of the capital. And, uh, we argue in the North, it needs a secular stagnation. So, very briefly, here's a summary of some of the post Keynesian literature. Jerry, Gerald Epstein at UMass Amherst gives this general, widely used definition of financialization. I think some of the structural features are familiar to everyone. Increasing importance financial markets, financial modus, institutions, elites, empirically, debt equity ratios for firms, much higher. So my daughter did <coughs> her own research on financialization on this topic. And the exorbitant uh, uh, executive pay, also these function as rents for productive capital. So you may recall that Milton Friedman advanced this principle many years ago, I think 1962 or something, that said that the only responsibility of a corporation or a firm is not to any stakeholders it may have, but only to its shareholders. So he advanced this principle of shareholder value maximization, the twin, the dual of utility maximization. And so this is uh, what is uh, on the agenda. So that's the story of capitalism. What's the story for Chicago School? Same argument. So after Kahneman and Tversky, what was thought to be only trade surpluses and trade with psychology turned out to be trade deficits. Or economics imperialism, suddenly accompanied by reverse psychology imperialism towards economics. And so if we were only exporting the disciplinary capital, utility maximization, and shareholder value maximization, now we have all these other principles from psychology, heuristics, uh, 
that your decisions are always from a particular location and so forth. These now inhabit, they've formed enclaves within economics. So the Ricardian argument goes this way. Rising in, within the heart of capitalism, intramarginal rents for Chicago. Because it now has to defend this in rational choice theory. Whereas previously it was taken as a, a, an unquestionable principle. So I can't talk about this in any detail, but if you talk about welfare economics, we know that it's based on the idea that you're supposed to satisfy preferences. Um, but which preferences? The ones that people appear to have behaviorally or their so-called rational preferences? So really, it, welfare economics since Kahneman and Aristide has become incoherent and they don't have a solution for this. So the strategy of defenders of the Chicago vision is to develop what are called dual selves models. Okay, you've got those preferences that reflect your uh, heuristics and biases, but somehow we can get to those real, true, rational preferences that underlie them. And if you read the literature here, uh, it's really quite uh, hopeless and quite uh, awkward. It's been criticized quite extensively. So this expression comes from Dan Houseman, and this comes from uh, Bob Sutton and his co-authors. And this is just a fantasy that there could be some rational agent within the real agent, the psychological agent that we see. So this is a, a defense. It's costly that the research time that Chicago School proponents have to uh, devote to defending the paradigm, uh, it, uh, it constitutes a cost or a rent that uh, that mainstream Chicago School approach uh, now has as a result of its interaction with other disciplines. So I'm just about done here with two slides to go. Uh, the, rent, the Ricardo argument, rent argument, suggests golden straitjacket is not a viable pathway in the long run. You think global federalism, well, depends on your view of the EU. <laughs> or the United States is a, is a federation also. So, But this is a, a much more complicated topic for us. And that leaves Bretton Woods. <coughs> so, when we talk about capitalism, we give up this. We go back before mobility of capital. We put grains of sand in the, the transmission mechanisms for capital mobility. We try to reachieve relative autonomy for nation states so they can address domestic policy goals and promote democracy within nations. Within economics and social science, this idea that there's only one way to do science goes. Top-down ideal goes. Disciplines remain relatively independent according to their subject matters, and researchers uh, carry out their uh, research as they choose. And so if you don't have a top-down, a north-south structure within economics, uh, then it's a flat uh, research space. There's no reason to think that what might be done by a Marxist economist is of any less value than what might be done by a neoclassical economist. That is, under Bretton Woods, we see an end to both economic and economics imperialism. Well, I hope to live longer than is likely, but uh, if I could live longer than is likely, then maybe I could see this. Uh, I, the sad thing is, is that the world changes much more slowly than our short lifetimes. And so we don't get to see what may happen, but I think it's better to have an ambition and a conception, not only of how we put an end to this, but also how we put an end to this. So last slide. We see the world as flatter, not just desiring that, we have reason to, to, to argue for it. So the red uh, type below is some of the basis for why we see the world as flatter. If we see science as a more bottom-up process, 
Why? Why would you imagine as a forecast that might come about? I wrote a paper on increasing specialization, and essentially the argument was it's now all trees, no forest. If people increasingly, as number of researchers and kinds of research multiply, if people continue to do projects that are really, it's hard to say what their connection is, the idea that there are overarching paradigms, conceptions of what science does and should do, is weakened. So when I used to teach in Amsterdam, uh, I said that uh, the idea that there's uh, a dominant approach in economics is a reflection of the Cold War. The Cold War ended. But in the Cold War, the capitalist economists had to say, well, no, here is this very distinct paradigm. And all these people over here who are not engaged in Chicago School of Economics are not doing real science, they continually said. Now we're not fighting that uh, big uh, history. We have all kinds of research that's being done. That I, I can't keep up with the variety of kinds of research that I see uh, emerging across the world. And so specialization, innovation, experimentation, we think are real processes characteristic of research and science. And so they make a case for Bretton Woods compromise. And if unity of science ideal goes out, then what is it that we hold on to about what science is supposed to do? We'll find out. And then later we'll find out something else. It's an evolutionary story. Social values, universal values about science are constantly changing. So we hope that we bring about this uh, conclusion. Thank you.